joy to be among you, returning from the Philippines. I bring greetings with me from the Hilltop Baptist Church and the staff and faculty of the Center of Biblical Studies uh, Institute and Seminary there in um, just north of Manila. It was a wonderful time to spend with the saints there and uh, to share the word at the conferences and uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how God in his faithfulness descends from heaven to bind us together, to, to bring us together in love, though we've, we've never met those people before. We have in common with other believers such, such a, a deep-rooted, glorious salvation that God has put within our hearts. And uh, I will be giving a full report of our trip on the second Sunday of May during our fellowship meal. So I will not be doing that at this time. So if you'd like to uh, come during our fellowship meal, I'll give an informal little chat, take some questions, and uh, Brother Danny Beshwadi and I just had a wonderful time. And I was telling a couple of the saints since I've been back, I have never before had more trials on a mission trip more testing of my own faith, but more blessing. Even in 11 years that I've gone to Nigeria, I've never been more blessed spiritually, personally, as well as the, the, the uh, apparent owning of the message and the ministry that, uh, as unworthy as we are, that, that God had truly has been pleased to bless than this last trip. <clears throat> and there were a couple of times in particular where I was extremely conscious and aware that somebody must be praying for me. Amen. And I know who they were. <laughs> so I, I, I was just so blessed. My, I had to hold my head down in thanksgiving, tears coming to my eyes, being very humbled because of the love and prayers of you brothers and sisters here at Christ Bible Church, though I was many thousands of miles away. So thank you so much, and I know that the saints there appreciated you, you loaning me to them for about a week and a half. Turn with me then in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. I want to bring a special message today. And then, God willing, next Lord's Day, we will resume our exposition of the book of Romans, beginning in chapter 8 and verse 1, the last of three chapters dealing with the doctrine of sanctification. Pray for me because this week is going to be... Um, one of, of great sharpening of iron in the workshop of the Word of God, wanting to do justice to Romans chapter 8, which is the capstone, which is the icing of the cake in our study of Romans chapter 6 through 8. But <clears throat> setting that aside for another week, I'd like to share with you about a very, very important topic, one that is very close to my own heart, the glory of Christ, the glory of Christ. And I think one of the most condensed and rich passages in all of the Bible, especially in the New Testament, on this topic is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The entirety of the chapter, but I will only be reading verses 7 through 18, which is the real core and heart of the glory of Christ in this text. Follow along as I begin reading at 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 7. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted 
in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. May the Lord bless this reading of his word to our hearts. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Every year during our annual business meeting, Pastor Owen gives the pastor's report. Sometimes uh, some of it is uh, a little monotonous because we, sometimes we repeat the same things. No changes having taken place during the, uh, during the previous year. But usually there's some additions and uh, good things to report on the part of the elders. But during the report, I don't know if you listen carefully to the pastor's report, Pastor Owen faithfully restates and affirms the three goals of Christ Bible Church, the three goals of this church. And I believe the three goals that every Christian should have. The number one goal of Christ Bible Church is on that list. How many of you know what that goal is? Raise your hand. How many know what the number one goal of Christ Bible Church every moment of every day of every year since February of 1990, over 22 years, has been? Let's say it together. The glory of God. That's the goal, the glory of God. That's why we were made. That's why we were saved. That God would create and redeem frail, fallible, dead human beings. We who are specks of dust, chaff blown in the wind. And use us to manifest His glory, to exalt His glory, and to cause His glory to be shouted in others before the throne of grace, to the glory and to the praise of His grace forever and ever and ever. This is an honor and a privilege that indeed magnifies the glory of God in ways that I would be hard-pressed in this message to describe and explain. And indeed, the glory of Christ and the glory of God in general is a very wide and deep subject. I'm only going to be able to bring out three aspects of the glory of Christ in this message. But there are many, many elements of God's glory with respect to God's nature, His creation. Many, in, in many elements of the glory of God that are, that are mentioned in many ways, in various shades, that are unfolded in Scripture with respect to God, that is the perspective of God concerning his own internal glory with respect to politics and kings and military leaders. There's a type of glory with respect to man, man made in the image of God alone, even though he may be unredeemed and unsaved. Still, there's a glory about him that we see as he is made in the image of God. So there's glory seen in the creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. And so there are many aspects of God's glory that we can bring out. But I want to talk about the one I love most. I want to bring out the one I enjoy thinking about and praying about and reveling in and marinating in and rejoicing in the most. Yes. And that's the glory of Christ as that glory relates to God's people. Because we have a share in that glory. And Christ died on the cross to gift us and give us the privilege to partake of that glory. Amen. Now indeed, we look through a glass darkly, and we don't partake of enough of that glory, but I want to celebrate that glory today, and I hope by the grace of God to present a picture, a vision, maybe a goal, for you to bring into your prayer closet, and to pray, Lord, like Moses, show me that glory. 
Oh, Lord, show me that glory. But let's define what we mean about this one aspect concerning God's glory, the glory of Christ. And these are only a few things about Christ's glory as we exalt and elevate the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ, to that unique unilat or that unique um, place of glory that God has elevated his son to. The, the place of glory that Christ occupies in the heart and mind of God and as Lord over all creation and as the judge of the earth and as the head of the church and as the king of saints is absolutely breathtaking. When you study the various aspects and nuances and shades of Christ's glory in terms of his exaltation alone, as it is, as it is presented in scripture, it really is mind-blowing because you realize as a child of God, you will be an inherent part of participating in that exaltation of Christ in which he will be glorified by all creation forever. Amen. And it's our job to try to dig deeper and deeper and deeper and unpack that glory while we're here on the earth and partake of it so that we're not aliens and strangers to it when we stand before him. The Lamb of God on his throne, shrouded in and surrounded by a radiant glory that cannot be defined by human language. A glory infinitely greater than any kind of ambient light that you have ever been exposed to in this world. Think about the brightest light, the sun. And take all the suns of all the galaxies of all the universes and put them all together. Yeah. It's like a faint and a dim light compared to the glory of Jesus Christ. Because he will be the only light and the only glory of eternity future. He will shine up and show up. Everything in the light that surrounds him. And he will be the only light because every eye will be on him. And all attention will be riveted upon him. That glory will be, will be unalterable. And it will never go unnoticed by any creature that God has made in the future. We will all be captivated by that glory. And that glory is so heart-wrenching. And so heart stopping, the captivation of that glory will last forever. You'll never become disinterested in it. You'll never turn aside and talk with some other human being because you suddenly lost interest in the glorious king on his throne. Well, I would define the glory of Christ in this way. Now, those of you who are used to taking notes, I'm going to push you a little bit, okay? Forgive me. First of all, the glory of Christ is the great honor and renown of Christ spread to all of creation and given to Christ by all creation. Every crevice of existence will shout forth the glory and renown and honor of Christ. The glorious Christ of Christ also is, is the great conferring of honor and majesty upon Christ by the Father. He will be so preeminent in the light of that preeminence, everything will pale in comparison. Nobody will want to give attention or credit or recognition to anyone or anything else but Jesus Christ. The Father puts the spotlight on Jesus alone, just like Walter read about on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Father will correct all the misunderstandings of the Peters and the James and the Johns about the, the essence of Christ's glory. On Mount Transfiguration, His glory shone forth, but for a moment, that glory was veiled by His humanity and His mission in this world. But in the life to come, his glory will bust out, brother, and will break out and will shine forth and there will be no crevice in this universe that will not cry out, glory, glory, glory to the Son of Man. Amen. Amen. And I'm here to remind you of that. The glory of Christ is the high, praiseworthy attributes 
and character of Jesus Christ. His name and His glory will ascend to the highest height. Now if my Bible says that His glory is infinite, there will be no height, there will be no ceiling, no, no bottom, no walls that will hold in His glory. What can hold in the glory of Christ? What can contain it? Lo and behold, wonder of wonders, He has chosen us as vessels, Amen. as temples of the living God to contain the glory of Jesus Christ. What an honor. What a privilege. What an unspeakable gift. This, is, this should cause us to be full of joy and expressible and full of glory. How can we talk about the glory of Christ without getting stirred up? Without expanding the borders of our intellect and imagination, our spirit and our hearts, and stretch them to the breaking point under the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're talking about glory. A glory that this world is blind to and dead to and darkened about. We're talking about a glory that will, on Judgment Day and thereafter, explode the heavens. And they will all the heavens be a spotlight shining upon the glory of Christ. Amen. And the glory of His attributes that, are, that have been hidden for so long that even the Word of God is hard to understand about those attributes will come out into the full blazing light of the Son of Truth. Every nuance, for example, of the goodness of Christ will come out You'll praise Him for 10,000 years about the infinite number of, of things about His goodness. Amen. And then when the Holy Spirit brings to our minds Christ as mediator, how long, how many decades, how many centuries, how many millenniums will we praise Him for being my mediator and being your mediator Amen. and stepping in between the wrath of God and hell. And shedding his blood over you. And covering you. And cleansing you from all sin. And imputing his righteousness into you. And imparting that righteousness. In the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit as a believer. Picking you up again. Picking you up again. Picking me up again. Oh I'm going to praise him for a long long time. Because he's my mediator. Oh this is glory brother. This is glory. And I'm here today to forget about the world and just to revel in that glory. Let's revel in it. Let's praise Him for it. Go ahead, you can praise Him. Don't let me stop you. Number four. The glory of Christ means adoration, praise, and thanksgiving offered to Christ in worship. This one is a little bit more simplified. But I'll tell you, there's a glory in it when the Holy Spirit helps you thank Him and praise Him and adore Him. Number five, His glory. Again, my vocabulary is stretched and my dic dictionary is stretched and my thesaurus is really stretched to the breaking point in trying to describe His glory. But His glory is the majestic beauty Radiant splendor like the sun set in a blaze of glory. Amen. How many times did the sun go out since you have been born? Since you have studied uh, astronomy or history? How many times did the sun go out in the last 6,000 years or so? None. Not one time. You would know it if it did, right? Well, think about the Lord Jesus Christ. A trillion times more glorious and radiant in His majesty than the sun. Who is from everlasting to everlasting in his nature. And his glory will never go out. Never pass away. That majestic, radiant glory and splendor will shine forth forever. And all of creation will continually be falling down before him in worship and praise. Amen. The glory of Christ is really the bliss of heaven. Because his glory really is a reflecting, reflecting who he is on the inside. His glory, we're not going to be worshiping light for light's sake. His glory, his Shekinah is only a reflection of who he is. 
in his nature. So good, so kind, so forgiving, so loving. Amen. So he's so full of glory that he reached down and he plucked you and me out of the miry clay. Amen. Saved our never dying souls from the pit. His glory manifests and radiates his love. His love for sinners. Amen. His love for his people. His love to forgive you again and again and again and again. 10,000 times 10,000. Thank God he's a God of 10,000 chances. That just reflects his glory. When his glory somehow reminds you that if it were not for his love and forgiveness and compassion and pathos, you would not be there and I would not be there in heaven. Marveling, just in awe of his glory. Amen. Just think about that. You will never get tired of admiring his glory and worshiping him in his glory. Now how long before you lose your sight after looking into the sun on a very bright day. Ophthalmologists say you shouldn't look into the sun for more than a few seconds because if you do, you can damage your retina. When I was a kid, I did that. I looked into the sun for about 20, 30 seconds and it took about a half hour for the spots to go away before my eyes. But I'm here to tell you, you're going to be marveling at the sun, S-O-N, you're going to be looking upon him. You're going to be in awe of him. You're going to be captivated by him. All of the unending, glorious attributes of his majesty will continually come before your eyes like a rolling thunder, like a crashing wave of the ocean, continually uh, revolving through your mind of all the glorious aspects of his nature and you're just never going to be tired of looking away your retinas spiritually will never be burned out and you will feed upon that glory for everlasting unto everlasting Amen. yep his glory is an aura emanating from Jesus Christ causing all creation to fall down before his exalted majesty in adoration and worship with great fervency for all eternity. With great fervency for all eternity. Those two words, fervency and eternity, are kind of small to describe eternity. How can you describe infinite eternity? How can you describe a fervency that we have never known the fullness of? I've partaken of token fervency when the Holy Spirit enables me to worship in the Spirit. Suddenly, there's a fervency that takes over in my spirit, and I'm on my face worshiping. Tears are flowing. My heart is beating, not for fear, but for joy and love. And this fervency is like travailing. In the spirit, in worship. Amen. Now, when we apply those two words to the context of beholding his glory, what a fervency that's going to be. I'm not going to have this humanity. I will not be in this flesh where the fervency will diminish. The fervency will grow weak. And my heart will long for more. For more fervency. Oh, this is glory. We don't know about this glory. But he has given us his son as the portal, as the channel, as the gateway, as the mediator by which we may more and more in this life and in the life to come forever partake of his glory. Amen. Of his glory. How can we talk about such things without the totality of our being swept up in such amazing thoughts and truths and concepts? The mind, the intellect, the spirit, the affections, the emotions, the logic, the reason being stretched to the breaking point. Even if and when alone describing the location of a glory in heaven 
that knows no borders. How can we define such a thing? But God says we will be partakers of it forever. That's why the hymn writer can say, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King. And what's the last part? The triumphs of His praise. The triumphs of His grace. The glories of my God and King. A thousand tongues will praise the glories of my God and King. Amen. And uh, so the glory of Christ continuing is the triumphant rejoicing of Christ over his enemies at the end of all things, resulting in every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God the Father is going to be glorified when every rebel tongue is, has finally grown silent from the cursing and the rebelling and the gossiping and the slandering and the calumny against the Son. And all tongues will be conformed to praising Him. Amen. And then the glory of Christ is the sharing, beholding, internalizing, and reflecting of Christ's glory in and by believers. Let me say that last one. Because I'm going to spend the rest of this message talking about that last one definition of the glory of Christ. Amen. Glory of Christ is the sharing, beholding, internalizing, and reflecting of God's or of Christ's glory in believers and by believers. So we're going to the master's level, the graduate level of Christianity 101 now, where we're talking about the very reason and purpose why we were saved. And before we do that, I want you to understand that, again, this is something we don't think about often enough, is that Christ manifests the glory of God. And the reason why is because Christ is the very image of God. If we would see what God would look like, Jesus Christ is the perfect representation in human form of the Godhead. Amen. There's three key texts in the New Testament. You don't have to turn with me. You can just write them down. Now we're talking about the nature of God himself. Christ has a critical role and place in bringing out the depths of God's nature before his redeemed humanity and unredeemed humanity. And God made Christ, therefore, the very image of God. And he made Christ walk down on this earth so we can analyze and study and internalize these deep aspects about the very nature of God himself. Because Christ is the image of God. In 2 Corinthians 4.4 it says, 2 Corinthians 4.4, Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The most glorious aspects of the gospel, salvation, forgiveness, Unmerited favor, imputed righteousness, reconciliation, propitiation, the mercy of God, Amen. the kindness of God, the love of God. All of these are manifested in the gospel. But the reason that they're manifested in the gospel is that many of these things are reflective of the very nature of God himself. And therefore, when it says... That the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. In the gospel, in the message of salvation, the very glory of God in His attributes emerge for us to behold. And we see them in the personality, in the character, in the atonement, and in the work of Christ in his earthly ministry and upon his death on the cross, we see these glorious attributes rise from their depths to the surface for us to behold such a depth of the glory of God. Amen. Before your conversion, you knew little or nothing of the love of God, the forgiveness of God, and the mercy of God. Those attributes were buried beneath the depths of darkness in your blindness, 
But when you believed in the gospel and you beheld Jesus Christ by, with the eye of faith, the Holy Spirit came and shined. He shined like a light, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And you are able to understand for the first time the mercy of God, the love of God in salvation, Amen. the kindness of God, the patience of God towards you and towards me. 20 years of patience for some of us after we've rejected again and again and again the gospel. Such a patience we never knew about before our conversion. It, was, it wasn't until we saw the gospel in Christ and behind the gospel the attributes of God came forth Amen. in the full blazing light of the character of Christ. To be seen through the character of Christ. Amen. So study Jesus and pray, Lord, reveal your glory to me. Reveal your glory to me. Amen. As I behold the perfections of Christ, the offices of Christ, prophet, priest, king, the priest and the offering, and the temple. He's all of it. Study Christ. Learn more of Christ and pray and pray and pray that the Holy Spirit will bring out the glory of God and His nature through the character and personality of Christ as seen in the Gospel. Amen. As seen in the Gospel. We need to dig out this glory. We need to dig it out. We need to fall on our faces like Moses On that mountain, Mount Sinai, yes. God touched something in Moses after dealing with him for a long time. Moses, if you read Exodus and Numbers, as I have this last week in preparing for this, Moses is going inside the tabernacle with his brother Aaron and out, in and out, and in communicating with God on behalf of the people. He's coming constantly in contact with the glory of God. As the theophany represented the glory of God in the smoke. Sometimes the priests couldn't minister because the smoke was so dense. They had to run out of the, They couldn't see their hand in, their, in front of their face. And they were with fear and trembling in their ministrations. They came into contact with the glory of God. So here is Moses in and out, in and out, praying for them in the tabernacle, coming into contact with the glory of God. Then God says to Moses, go up on the mountain. I have some tablets of stone to give you, the Ten Commandments. And there, up on that mountain, he's talking with God face to face as one talks with a friend. And little tokens of the glory of God begin to prompt Moses for more of the glory. His appetite for the glory began to expand and deepen until finally he said, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would deepen our appetite. Even if he begins with small amounts and little tokens, fine, fine. But if it, if that leads us as a congregation to say to God cumulatively during our prayer meetings, show us your glory. Show us your glory. Amen. That is enough for us. Amen. That is enough for us. Jesus, who is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The express, the exact, the perfect replica an image of the person and nature of God as God's nature is revealed from the outside to the innermost part of his nature. If we would look at God from the inside out, going to the very core of who God is and where he lives, Christ reflects that nature of God inside out. Christ is the image of of the innermost being, nature, attributes, and substance of God. Now, with that backdrop, let's talk about number one, beholding the glory. I'm not talking about with our naked eye. No. There's a different kind of beholding. And when Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration, 
They were beholding Christ naturally with a naked eye. Physically, they were seeing him. But the, there's a different kind of sight that God has designed for us to behold Christ with. And the transfiguration is a statement about the veiled glory of Christ and the unveiled glory of Christ. Two different kinds. The veiled glory and the unveiled glory. Unbelievers know nothing of that unveiled glory. It is veiled to them. It is covered. But God in Christ has given us the privilege to have that glory uncovered for us. And that uncovered glory motivates us and inspires us to serve, to love, to worship, to pray, to obey, to trust, to even lay down our lives Amen. for the glory of Christ. Many of the martyrs, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, have had their last prayers answered that they would be faithful when their tormentors and persecutors would martyr them and put them to death, whether it be on the stake, burned at the stake, or nailed to a cross, that they would be faithful to the end. But God in His grace and in His amazing love would do much more very often to these martyrs. He would unveil His glory to them. And so that at some point in the physical torture of their flesh, they would travel into another zone where the physical pain would not be as profound a weight on them and a concern to them as the unveiled glory that they are experiencing or they experienced at some point in that martyrdom. Just like our dear brother Stephen. What happened with Stephen? You know what happened with Stephen? At some, somewhere along the line, the glory was unveiled and he saw the Son of Man sitting on his throne. He saw the Son of Man at the right hand of the Father. Amen. God gave him a special revelation of his glory. I'm not saying that we have a physical sight of Christ. No, I'm not talking about that. In Stephen's case, he did have a physical revelation of, of Christ. But ultimately, that situation was the unveiling of Christ's glory. And suddenly, the martyrdom, the martyrdom, where the martyrdom left off, the glory caught him up even before he died as he was being stoned. He prayed, lay not this sin to their charge. Brother, only someone who's full of glory can say that as their body is pummeled in martyrdom. That's the kind of glory I want. That's the glory that the martyrs receive. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them. As you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and that's the glory that motivates us as Christians just to do the ordinary, normal work of the believer. And we have a lot of work to do right here in California. Amen. I was telling last November, I was telling our Nigerian brethren there in Lagos, I said, and I, I said to some of the Filipino brethren just a couple weeks ago, I said, you need to send missionaries to America. The church is not doing its job in general, in general. But I think the more we partake of the glory, yes. we'll do our job. We won't need a lot of this stuff, these techniques, these gimmicks to do the work of the Lord. The glory will propel us forward. And that will be our reward. Amen. And that will be our wages. The glory. Give me more of the glory, Lord. Silver and gold have I none. But give me the glory, Lord. Amen. And he says, he tells us that he saves us for a very high and holy call, calling that we might behold his glory. This is what he prayed in John 17. Don't you remember that? Turn to John 17. His high priestly prayer. John 17, verse 24. We would see Jesus we would partake of his glory. John 17, 24. Father, this is his high priestly prayer in the upper room after his discourses from John uh, 14, 15, and 16. He then prays, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may what? 
Behold my glory, which you have given to me. There's no prayer of Christ that never went unanswered. His prayer is for us to behold the glory. To get a spiritual sight of the glory of Jesus Christ. That glory encompasses all of the attributes, all of the perfections, and the nature of God as illuminated by the Holy Spirit, as given comprehension to us by the Holy Spirit. And all of these things related to the glory of God is confirmed and is tested by the doctrines of the Word of God. There's, there's no such thing as experiencing the glory as a mystical cosmic experience that is not conformed to the Word of God completely when it is tested by every doctrine and verse of the Bible. Amen. I'm not talking about a vision some nirvana utopian experience that the Bible knows nothing about. Isaiah beheld the glory of Christ. And John in 1241 talks about these, this. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Remember in Isaiah chapter uh, 60. Um, Isaiah 6 rather. 1 through 5, where Isaiah saw the vision of the exalted Christ in his glory. And what was the vision all about? The vision was all about the holiness of Christ. Amen. And Christ was seen in his glorious holiness. And in the, in, in the reflection of his glory, Isaiah saw his sinfulness and he said, woe is me. When you see the glory, you don't want to have anything to do with sin anymore. If you're involved in sin... In the light of God's glory, you see everything detestable and loathsome that is not conformed to his glory. So when we partake of the glory, there's a cleansing, a sifting, a healthy work internally that takes place when you behold the glory. And how do we behold the glory? Well, the glory is beheld when it's reflected from reading the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God is compared to a mirror. And when the Holy Spirit, in your reading and meditation on the, whole, on, on the Word of God, pulls back the veil of the, of the letter of the law and makes it a living Word, you will be given the ability to behold the glory of Christ. The beholding or reflecting of the glory as in a mirror is, is an inward glory, is an inward glory produced by the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. The disciples beheld this glory, Amen. the glory of Christ. In John 1.14 it said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This glory was veiled to the Pharisees. Many of them saw Christ's miracles. But there was another level of unveiling and revelation needed for them to behold His glory. As Christ reflected the divine attributes and perfections of the Godhead. And the Holy Spirit for the disciples. Peeled back. This dullness. This spiritual. Deadness. This blindness. And allowed the disciples. To see the glory of Christ. We behold this glory. Amen. When as we study the word. And meditate on the word. And lay the word up richly in us. Repent of our sins. We trust in the cleansing blood of Jesus to wash away everything that would resist the work of the Holy Spirit. That we might behold the glory. We trust in Jesus Christ to send forth the comforter, to send forth the teacher, to reveal the living Christ in his glory to our hearts. This word, beholding him, beholding him, we beheld his glory. This is the revelation of the knowledge of Christ to your spiritual man. The Holy Spirit reveals 
the glory, the, the majesty, the splendor, and the beauty, and the preciousness of Christ to your spiritual man. Amen. This is a vital experience. This is what renews us and cleanses us and revives us in our relationship with Christ, in our love for Christ. This is critical. This is a non-negotiable experience. And we must do our part as opposed to this new age or this new teaching in many churches called the emergent church, which says we do nothing. Christ did it all. What they're teaching is that positionally, since Christ did everything, we do nothing. We don't have to read. We don't have to pray. They may not say that. And they will say we believe in holiness. But in the end, they deny human responsibility. And if you don't obey what God commands you to do, especially if he commands you to do something that has been ordained by him as a channel and a means of grace, then you're not going to be channeled the grace of God to you. You're not going to receive that grace. But we, we behold, we behold him. And it is the beholding of the divine attributes and perfections and glory of Christ. In a way, in our Bible study, in our prayer time, when the Holy Spirit comes alongside and declares Christ to me and reveals Christ to me so that I can behold him with my spiritual man, this dynamic has a profound effect upon me. It has a changing or a transforming effect. The effect is to sift out that which is of the old man and to put on that which is diminishing from the new man, to put it on afresh, to put it on anew, to be freshly clothed in imparted righteousness. John 1 describes it as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. That is, it's a glory that is unique to Jesus Christ that he shares with no one. It's a glory that comes close to you that you know Jesus is revealing himself to you. He's whispering to you. He's speaking to you as only he can, spiritually speaking, through the word, by faith. He's speaking to your heart as the unique divine son of the Father. It says he's full of grace and truth. The, the only Begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And His glory touches you. It's a divine quality when He reveals Himself to you. You feel grace coming in and you find yourself confessing to Him, I'm not worthy, Lord. Thank you for this joy. Thank you for this fresh love. Thank you for this peace. Thank you for this fresh, fresh assurance. And behind all the fruits of the Spirit flooding back in in a fresh way, you see that you're beholding the one who was full of grace and truth. It is grace that sent forth the flood of the fruits of the Spirit upon the dry ground of our hearts. Amen. Based on the truth. Purchased by faith in Jesus Christ afresh. He is the truth. In 2 Corinthians 3, if you turn there, you should already be there. But if 2 Corinthians 3, God has been contrasting the glory of the Old Testament law with the glory of the new covenant. Now the glory of the... New Covenant is not the final destination that God is leading us to in the doctrine of 2 Corinthians 3. The glory of the Old Testament was passing away, as we read, and is being replaced by the glory of the New Covenant, which is permanent. The Old Testament glory, as, as bound up and reflected in the law, is temporal. There's a glory in it, but it's temporary. Ultimately, the law by itself kills but there's a new glory coming as manifested in the new covenant, which makes alive, which is renewable, renewable, repeatable. Amen. 
unto the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This new glory of the new covenant takes the letter of the law and makes it living and new and alive within the people of God. And is an instrument helping us to be transformed and renewed into his image. And so God has been reducing the glory of God in second, as taught in 2 Corinthians 3 down to its essence as he proceeds throughout the text in 2 Corinthians 3. First he says there's a temporary glory in the tablets of stone, but that's being replaced with a permanent ministry, which secondly is the ministry of the Spirit, as we read in verse 8. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? The ministry of the Spirit replaces the ministry of the law, although the ministry of the Spirit uses the Word of God as a channel, as a tool, but it is no longer like it was in the Old Testament where there was no Spirit coming in to give life to the law. Now, in the New Testament, the Spirit of God comes in and gives life to the law, and when applied to an unsaved person regenerates that individual and when applied to a saved person renews that grace that was deposited in his or her heart upon regeneration. And then thirdly in verse 17, God is reducing everything from the corporate, from the dispensation level down to the individual level. He says uh, in verse 17, now the spirit of uh, the, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And uh, in verse 17, God says the ministry of the Spirit is described here in the New Covenant as providing liberty. Where the Spirit of God is, there's liberty. In our corporate worship, there should be liberty. In our individual walk, there should be enlargement of heart. Amen. To apprehend spiritual things. To apply spiritual things. To assimilate spiritual things. And may I say it? To experience spiritual things. Experience is not a bad word. When it comes to knowing those things that Christ has died to give us. Which is to, be a, to share in his glory. Our experience must be defined and circumscribed and tested by the scriptures. Because much of today's experience in many so-called churches is not only unscriptural, but in many places satanic and counterfeit. And anything spiritual in the Christian life, anything genuinely spiritual that the Bible describes can be counterfeited. Satan comes as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. They come with half-truths to hook people in and then they give them the lie and then they come with the counterfeit, which appears like the real thing, but it's not. But what I'm saying is, a glory is not a purely objective doctrine. Over and over and over again, the Bible teaches, first of all, that we behold His glory with the spiritual eye. We are able to apprehend, we're able to comprehend in our spirit some of, some of the depth of the glory of God's infinite, precious attributes and characteristics. In other words, the Holy Spirit takes the veil away from our eyes that obscures the glory of Christ. This is why this Old Testament imagery is important. In the Old Testament, the veil was covering their eyes. Moses put a veil over his face coming down off the mountain to symbolically and figuratively represent that God is holding back the glory. The people cannot partake of the glory. The, the glory is veiled, but uh, Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the veil is what? Taken away. Say that. Taken Amen. away. The veil is taken away. We should be able to behold the glory of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's encouraging, brethren. And he says, therefore, we have boldness of speech. Verse 13, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded 
At the end of verse 14, the veil is taken away in what? In Christ. Now in Christ, the veil is removed. The Holy Spirit takes away the veil off of our eyes, which has been preventing us from beholding the beauty, the splendor, and the glory of Jesus Christ. Pray in your quiet time, Lord, take away the veil that I might behold him. Take away the veil that I might behold him. This is what this means. Pastors should be urging the people to, to, to trust that the work of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us as John 16 says, to declare Christ to us. How does he declare him? The glory of Christ, the Shekinah, the radiant glory is but the rim. It's like the ring around Saturn. It, it, it shines forth with glory. Concerning the infinite depths of what is beneath that shining. What is beneath that glory and that splendor. Which is God himself. God himself. Christ himself. He's the treasure. He is the riches. I want Jesus Christ. I am absolutely committed as the pastor of this church. As long as God gives me breath. And as long as I have a sane mind and he gives me grace, I am going to keep insisting on all of us, all of us pressing in with the Lord until we behold more and more of his glory. Amen. I want more of his glory. Amen. Even if it was just me and my wife in this church, I would feel the same way. Amen. Even if I could never preach Amen. another sermon, Amen. I would feel the same way. I want to know more of the glory of Christ. I want to behold the glory. He says the veil is taken away in Christ. I'm not under Moses anymore. Are you? No. I don't have a veil over my eyes anymore. I've been redeemed. I've been saved. The Holy Spirit has illuminated my understanding. I'm no longer alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in me, because of the blindness of my heart. God has shined the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ into my heart. I'm a believer. I walk with him in the light as he is in the light. His spirit teaches me the meaning and the depths and, and the, the greatness of what his doctrines mean to my heart and my mind. And all of it points to Christ and this, this unfathomable treasure that we have in Christ called glory. And this glory is like the icing on the cake because when we partake of the glory... It leads us to go deeper into the cake. And what's, what's inside the cake? The, in, what's inside the cake, as represented by the icing or the glory, are the attributes of Christ. The love of Christ, the patience of Christ, the kindness of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ. And as the Holy Spirit makes all of those attributes of Christ real and freshly meaningful to my heart, I respond with praise. I respond with, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, that's why I'm saved. I remember now. That's why I'm saved. To love on Jesus. To praise Jesus. To revel in His glory as an end in itself. For the end of the law is Christ. Yes. I've arrived at the end of the rainbow, brother, and we all are following our own rainbow, which we think is leading to some spiritual Shangri-La. But the Bible says at the end of the rainbow is the glory of Christ. Amen. And then when we achieve that, that special moment where we partake of the glory, all the doctrines dovetail into one. They become interlocking and like one, we, they're separate, but they're one because we see them one dimensionally when we partake of the glory. How do you mean? Well, we see them all together, all the doctrines of God together as a pedestal which elevates and exalts Jesus Christ as the revelation of God to man, as central to the plan and thought of God. Jesus Christ as the supreme manifestation of the deepest nature and being and substance of God himself. Yes. What an honor for us to know God inside out this way. 
inside out this way. Let us, let us get busy with this glorious work, this holy calling. This high mission and calling is above the calling of every angel. All the angels do is cry out, holy, holy, holy. They cry out, there's glory there, but brother, you and I go inside the glory and we partake of it. We swim in it. And wonder of wonders, yes. we ingest it. Amen. <sighs> I can't explain it. Forgive me for my limited vocabulary. But I think you know what I mean. I'm going to stop there. Next time we'll talk about internalizing the glory and then reflecting that glory. I preached this sermon to these fo dear folks in uh, the Philippines. They didn't know what to do with it. Why? Not because you folks are better than them, but because they haven't been taught. They haven't been taught. And many of the leaders there are not bringing this glorious truth center stage. Amen. Where it needs to stay. Christ, Jesus, our glory. He's our glory. Oh, will you go to him today and pray like Moses. Lord, show me that glory. Show me that glory. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Son. Thank you for him who is the very image of God, the brightness of your glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching us and showing us the way to the Father. For if we've seen you, we've seen the Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus for opening our eyes, unstopping our ears, and melting our hearts so that we can see as you see and know the glory of Christ. We pray that as a church, we would not lose sight of this glorious calling to part be partakers of the glory of Christ. Lord, help us. For our we are flesh, this this treasure is in earthen vessels. And we so often get distracted by the cares of this life. We want the glory to remain center stage. We pray that, that it not only will remain in the forefront of our minds and attention, but that we would be able to plunge into the ocean depths of the glory of Christ in the coming days ahead, that we would internalize in the depths of our being, your glory, Lord Jesus, that we might become like you more and transform more into your image. And that in response, we would be able to reflect your glory to others, that we would be a savor of the knowledge of God, reflecting your glory to others around us. Oh, Lord, we can't do this by ourselves, but we pray that your spirit would come and give us that liberty, give us that enlargement of mind and heart and spirit that would enable us frequently to be partakers of your glory. For this is our prayer. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.